Uh, my name is Matt Williams, and I'm the evangelist at Datadog. Uh, Datadog's a SaaS-based monitoring platform. Uh, basically load up an agent on each host that you want to monitor, and we start collecting data about everything that's going on, including stuff about Nginx, or Apache, or MySQL, or Postgres, or the operating system, or whatever it is, and bring it together in a nice dashboard. But I don't really want to talk about Datadog here. I want to talk about Nginx, and load balancing, and caching. And um, so you can reach me if you've got any questions. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter. I'm Technovangelist. Or uh, my email is matt.williams hmm. at uh, datadoghq.com. And, um, and again, this session is scaling web applications with Nginx load balancing and caching. Now, this session is not going to tell you what is the number one most optimal configuration for load balancing and caching because there is no such thing, because it totally depends on your environment. It totally depends on what you're, what you're serving and what, uh, what do the assets look like? What do the pages look like? What, kind of, what, what are you doing with, uh, with Nginx? So there's no way I can give you, here's the one thing that works for everyone, because it doesn't exist. Uh, but what I can do is kind of go over an overview of all the different uh, features available or configuration options available with uh, load balancing and caching, and, um, and talk about a way of just testing and verifying that anytime you make changes, they're actually doing something good. Uh, so that's what I want to focus on. Um, but first off, uh, you know, what, what, why are we talking about load balancing and caching? What's the purpose? Really, the purpose is just to make that experience for that end user a whole lot better. And that's going to be a whole lot better by reducing lag, because we're going to be able to distribute the load across multiple servers and hopefully limit failure. Um, and we do that in load balancing uh, by basically load, uh, allowing multiple web servers to handle all the load that's coming in from all the users around the world. And then no single web server is going to be overloaded once we uh, put this in place. Well, hopefully. Eh, you still could be super popular and still overload stuff. But hopefully, you'll have something in place that allows for you know, handling all that extra load. And then the user just thinks, ah, it's all one server. I just connect to one server, and it just works. It's a magic. Um, caching uh, adds to this by basically taking away, taking all that, uh, the, the processing power to serve static assets away from the web server and move it on to a, a more dedicated um, a server that uh, can really handle focus on, on doing that. So load balancing, there's actually a lot of options available. Uh, there's a five major uh, load balancing methods that you can choose from when setting up load balancing with Nginx. The first four here um, are available in all the you know, Nginx uh, open source and Nginx Plus, while the last one is actually a, a Nginx Plus uh, feature. And I tend to note that with a little plus sign um, on the, this slide and future slides. Um, so the first off is round robin. And hopefully, that's kind of self-explanatory. You know, you set up a upstream server block or upstream block. Um, and within that upstream block, you say server, I don't know, web server one, server, web server two, server, web server three. So you define all your servers that you want to um, uh, be in your in your group of uh, load balanced servers. And then each request that comes in is going to go to the next one. So the first request goes to web server one, second request to web server two, third request to web server three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, so forth. But the one uh, change to that is that you can actually set up waiting. Um, so with each one of those servers, I could say server, um, web server one, wait equals two. Uh, in that case, you know, the requests that are going to come in are going to go to server one, server one, server two, server three, server one, server one, server two, server three, and so forth. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty easy. Um, if you don't do any configuration, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get round robin. But then there's another option, which is least connected. And least connected basically is saying, hey, which server, which uh, upstream web server has the fewest connections? And whatever that is, that's the server that's going to get the next request. So if I've got two servers with 10 active connections and one web server with one active connection, well, the next uh, nine requests are all going to go on to that uh, server three, assuming all those 10 connections stay open uh, the whole time. 
then there's a couple other uh, uh, load balancing methods, uh, mostly set up to uh, provide um, session uh, persistence. So the first one is IP hash. IP hash uh, is basically going to take a, a hash of the first three octets of an IP address. And every time uh, some, a request comes in from that same IP address, it's going to go to the same uh, web server, and thereby you know, providing that uh, session persistence. It's a little bit more than session persistence. It's basically lifetime of the web server persistence. Um, so every time I come back to this web server from this IP address, I'm going to get the same web server. Maybe that's good, maybe bad. Uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, internal inside a corporation uh, and you've got an in internet, probably everybody has the same IP address and now all, everybody's going to go to the same web server, which is not, not all that useful in a load balancing scenario. And so in that case, we've got generic hash. In generic hash, we can totally customize how are things being distributed. Maybe it's a little a combination of IP address and also uh, query variables or URL or something else. Uh, all these things can come in together um, to, uh, and, and every time you know, all those things match, it's going to go to the same server. Now the fifth option, the fifth method, is something that's specific to Nginx Plus, and that's least time. And least time is actually going to be a combination of least connected, so the, whichever server has the fewest connections, along with uh, lowest response time. So whichever server is responding most quickly uh, and has the fewest active connections is going to get that next request. Uh, but again, that is a Nginx Plus specific feature. Oh, and that is also optionally weighted. So you can add the weight equals 2 or weight equals 10 uh, to get 10 times as many um, requests. OK, cool. So that's great. But which one do I choose? Well, it depends on you know, the kind of things that you're serving out. Round robin is great. If all the servers are identical, all the locations are identical, all the requests are maybe not short-lived, but at least the same length. Um, and it's the default. If you don't make any changes, that's what you're going to get. Least connected is really good if, again, all servers are identical, all servers in the same location, but sessions are variable. Sessions have a different length of time that they live. Um, and the reason why this happens is that if I think of, uh, I've got those three uh, load balance servers. And uh, the first request that comes in is really, really short. It's processed super quick, 10 milliseconds or something crazy. Uh, the next request that comes in is a really long one, and it takes a long time. And uh, third one, really short. Fourth one, really short. Fifth one, really long. Somehow this just keeps happening over and over and over again. And uh, we end up seeing that uh, server two is getting all these huge re requests that are lasting a long time, and the other servers are really short. Um, round robin's not really going to work for that because you know, the more connections that are on this box, you know, if I multiply three times, actually 100, so I've got 300 of these uh, requests or 300 of these connections coming in on that one box, we could be approaching that maximum number of connections that this box can handle on its own, especially if we're buying a super cheap uh, EC2 instance. Um, and uh, so as I reach that maximum number, now the server is going to take longer and longer to process each request, or going to start serving out 500 errors, uh, and which is not going to be a good user experience for that end user. Um, so least connected gets rid, avoids that uh, by basically saying, well, if we've got a bunch of short-lived connections, well, that server should handle the next uh, request that comes in, and not the one that already has two or 200 existing connections. IP hash, we kind of already talked about why I use IP hash. Basically, if the first three octets of the client address are the same, it's going to go to the same uh, uh, server. And so it's a simple way of providing session persistence. Generic hash, we already talked about that as well. Another way of providing some simple session persistence. Least time is interesting because you know the servers can be in different places, different configurations, big server, small server, uh, variable length of sessions, and, um, and it, the Nginx is going to be able to handle that. And the way it does that is actually with a health check. That's one of those features of Nginx Plus, where there's a, 
uh, you know, the, the load balancer is sending requests from load balancer to the upstream web servers, but it's also got this kind of back channel conversation going on between the load balancer and each of the upstream web servers. And that back channel is just saying, hey, are you healthy? Are you there? Everything all good? Um, and that request, that, that health check could go to the, the main URL, or it could go to a special URL that you define for this health check. So maybe I have um, a health check that not only verifies that the server is running as it should and processing things quickly like it should, but also the web server behind it, is, or sorry, the, the SQL server or uh, 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 database behind it is all good. And if that's, everything's all working good, then report back to the uh, load balancer that, hey, everything's good, I, I'm still here, I'm all good. But if that, uh, maybe if that database is gone, then uh, there's a problem and I shouldn't be available for uh, uh, requests. So those are some different reasons why you might choose one method versus another. So some things to keep in mind when it comes to load balancing. The load balancer server is going to drop any empty headers. If you see an empty header, or if it sees an empty header, it's going to drop it. It's also going to drop any headers with underscores in it. And so if you're relying, if the web server is relying on some header that's got an underscore in it, um, and uh, you're relying on it, well, it's not going to be there unless you change, there's an option to, that you can change to, to make that available. Um, the load balancer is going to rewrite the host header. So uh, basically make it seem like this uh, request is actually coming in from the load balancer. This is totally configurable. You can change that to whatever you like. Hash methods, we talked about already, result in kind of a lifetime persistence. Not life, like lifetime of the user, but lifetime of that server. Um, and then um, servers might come up and code down. And uh, when a server goes down, you don't want it to be still in that uh, uh, upstream pool of servers. And so if you're using Nginx Plus, you can use health checks for that. <coughs> health checks are going to uh, you know, just verify that the server is live and, and working as it should. But if you don't have Nginx Plus, then you can rely on max fails and uh, fail timeout. So max fails is the maximum number of failures that can happen uh, within a time period. And the fail timeout is that time period. So I could say max fails equals three, uh, fail timeout equals 90 seconds. And so if I see three failures within 90 seconds, that server is no longer going to be served requests. But, uh, oh, and then it's going to uh, uh, recheck every 90 seconds. Basically, it's going to use that fail timeout number again. It's going to keep checking every 90 seconds. Oh, is it there? No, okay, oh, it's still down. Oh, is it there? No, okay, it's still down. So uh, that's a way to, another way to make sure that uh, the servers that should be there are there. Now, with, uh, if I've got a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a load balancer server and a bunch of web servers behind it, and I want to, uh, you know, the reason I put it there is because I want to avoid the problem that happens if I have just one box. If I have one box and I reach a certain number of connections, I'm going to start, that box is, might start serving out 500 errors. And I don't want to avoid that. But if I get, I've got now four uh, load balance web servers, and all of a sudden my website got four times more popular, I'm also running into that same threshold. Um, and so I might want to establish a maximum number of connections uh, per web server. And uh, so maybe that maximum number, I don't know, 500 or something like that. Um, and uh, if I go over that, then it gets added to the queue. And so you can specify a queue. Uh, and this, these are features of, uh, again, Nginx Plus. Proxy buffers is something that you're going to want to look at if you're, depends on the type of connection. So there are really two types of connections when dealing with load balancing. You know, there's a, the client to the load balancer is one part, and then the load balancer to the upstream server is another part. And chances are, the load balancer to the upstream, that's going to be super fast because they're probably in the same data center. They're all really close to each other. But that client to load balancer, that's going to be a little bit longer. And to be able to deal with that difference in time, uh, Nginx uses proxy buffers. Uh, and so there's a lot of settings available to change you know, the proxy buffers. So if you're in a, inside a corporation where all the users are all in the same place, then maybe you don't need those proxy buffers. Maybe you can turn that off 
um, and uh, uh, get a little bit better performance. But if your users are out in the real world, maybe you really do need those proxy buffers. And there are eight to 10 uh, different settings around setting up proxy buffers that are just right for your environment. How to ensure session persistence? Well, we already talked about two of them, IP hash and generic hash. Um, kind of a crude way of doing it, just saying, hey, every, anytime I got the same IP address or the same IP address and URL and uh, uh, query variables and all that, then send it to the same server. But there's also some other ways if we're using Nginx Plus. First off, there's cookie insertion. Anytime I see a new request, or anytime the load balancer sees a new request come in, it's going to add, inject a, um, a, a new cookie that says, hey, this is a brand new request. This is session number, I don't know, one, two, three, four. Um, and every time another request comes in, uh, it's gonna send that same cookie over, and um, uh, it's gonna say, oh, this is session one, two, three, four. Let me hand it off to the same server. There's also learn, which is kind of like cookie inspection where the, uh, you just tell uh, Nginx to, okay, now look out for this particular cookie and this particular parameter, maybe a session ID, and when you see that, that's a session ID, and make sure that all sessions with the same ID go to the same server. So it's another way of ensuring session persistence. Sticky routes, kind of similar an idea to generic hashes, um, and you can uh, read up uh, more about what makes those different. One other thing with Nginx Plus is draining. Uh, being able to say, well, you know, I've got a, a bunch of connections that are coming in, um, but I know that this server, this one server has got to come down. It's got to come down for maintenance. I can say, I want to start draining the sessions. Uh, so I can say, uh, um, you know, turn that on, and all new requests are going to go to the other servers, but the existing uh, sessions that continue coming to that server are going to be uh, routed, you know, continue being served by that same server. And when, when everything's gone, I can bring down the, that server. Okay, cool. So that's a little bit about load balancing. Let's talk a little bit about caching. Uh, caching basically offloads the static content from web servers, and those objects are cached to disk. Enabling caching, pretty easy to do. Uh, proxy cache uh, path specifies what the path is on the file system to uh, store all of my objects. Uh, I specify key zones equals name. Uh, so what do I want to call this zone? Um, and then also a size. What's the maximum size? How, how big can this uh, cache get before I start getting rid of stuff? And then how do I start storing uh, the, the cached assets? That's done by a proxy cache key. Uh, and that key, if I don't change anything, it's going to be something like scheme, so HTTPS or HTTP, uh, proxy host, maybe www.datadog.com, um, uh, URI, so continuing the path of, uh, I don't know, slash my favorite integrations, and arguments, I don't know, something else. Um, proxy cache valid says, um, you know, if I have a, uh, a 200 uh, response code, that's going to be valid for a maximum of, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. But a 404, let's drop that uh, cache validity to 10 seconds. Proxy cache minimum or min uses is just saying, what's the minimum number of uses or minimum number of times that this asset needs to be served before it gets cached? So if I say two, then uh, the first time it gets uh, served, we're not gonna cache it. But the second time, it's gonna go ahead and get cached. Proxy cache methods just says, okay, I can cache anything with uh, a get or a post or something else. And then, so all that's done within the HTTP block or server block. Um, and then uh, look in the location block, I'll say proxy cache, and then specify which zone I want to use. And that zone was defined back in that first line. And then when do I want this to expire? So the location is going to be, you know, perhaps a specific path or a specific uh, type of asset. Um, maybe it's CSS or PNG files or JPEGs or whatever it is. And then for all those, all things that match that location, they expire after, it could be 10 hours, four, five hours, whatever you want, 10 years, I don't know what it is, um, whatever you want it to be. <coughs> Some things to keep in mind with caching. Hopefully the first one is obvious. Don't cache personal or private content. If somebody, if somebody comes in and uh, visits their personal uh, account page, 
last thing you want to do is cache that page so that the next user sees it. Hey, their, their account page comes up super quick. It's just all wrong. So that would be bad. Another thing to check is uh, ensure that permissions are set correctly on the cache path. Uh, you're going to define this back on in the Nginx configuration file. Um, and then you're going to have to create that directory. Just ensure that the user and group that uh, is running Nginx um, is the owner of, uh, of that path. Now, we've talked about caching static assets, but you could also cache, you know, if you've got a PHP site, you could cache the results of that PHP uh, uh, page. Um, and in order to do that, you're basically using all the same parameters, but replacing the word proxy with fast CGI. Or if you're using UWSGI, what's the right pronunciation? UWSG? Anyway, um, you're going to use fast CGI or UWSGI cache uh, parameters instead of proxy cache parameters. With any, uh, uh, caching, any cached asset, you can override the headers. And then Plus also offers the cache loader, cache manager. Uh, the cache manager is basically a, um, a way of purging old uh, assets uh, automatically. And Proxy Cache Purge, uh, another way of uh, purging um, older assets. Now, there's a lot of tuning that you can do with Nginx. There's a great article. Pretty much goes through all the different options. Uh, Nginx.com slash blog slash tuning Nginx. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, and uh, some of these include backlog queue. Backlog queue is normally really, really low on Nginx. Uh, normally, Nginx is going to respond to all the requests super quickly. That's the whole point of it. And so you don't usually need a backlog. But maybe you're reaching that maximum uh, number of connections, and so you might want to turn this on, turn on uh, the backlog. Well, increase the, the number of uh, connections that go into that backlog queue. Um, ephemeral ports. Every time a request comes into the load balancer and then is forwarded on to uh, the upstream web server, it sends it out from the load balancer using another port. And you might hit, you know, if you're sending out, you've, you've got so many live connections or active connections at once, you potentially could run out of ports. And so that's one of those uh, things that you might want to change. Worker processes is one of those really easy things to change. Usually worker processes should be uh, equal to the number of uh, CPU cores on that box. Um, so pretty easy to figure out and change, and you should get a little bit better performance there. Uh, logging is another one. Uh, logging takes a little bit of uh, processing time. So if we turn that off for some connect or some requests or all requests, uh, it's going to uh, give you a little bit uh, extra bump. Send file. Um, I can't remember the details of send file, but I know one scenario, one really super weird scenario where send file is really important. And that's if you happen to be using a development environment on your Mac and you happen to be doing it in Docker, and Docker is running on top of VirtualBox, and you're sh doing a shared volume, um, and that shared volume is being served out on Nginx, then um, if you make any changes to any files that are being shared on that volume, Nginx won't see those changes until you restart the Docker container, which totally sucks. Um, and so in order to avoid that, send file off, and oh my god, everything is magic again, and it just works. Uh, it's one of those weird things with VirtualBox, and if that's somehow involved in your chain. Um, but anyway, uh, limits, another great thing. Uh, you can limit number of uh, connections, limit uh, various things. Uh, compression, turning on compression. OK, cool. So now that we've talked about that, now how do you find that right configuration? We've talked about all these configuration options. How do you know if you've got to the right thing? Well, it's kind of an eight-step process. Well, eight to 800-step process. Um, the first step, read the docs. Usually a good thing to do. Read the mm, manual. Um, and then uh, read the rest of the web, because there's all sorts of amazing stuff out there. And then don't start with configuring the whole environment. Just focus on that one web server. One web server. Just make sure that one web server is working really well for your specific environment. Don't go trying to solve everything. Solve that one little problem. Um, monitor it. Turn on some sort of monitoring solution. I hope it's Datadog, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and test it. Test it with some sort of solution. I'll talk about a little bit about testing. 
Uh, and then once you get to uh, step five, go back to step three and repeat that. Keep repeating until you get something that really works in your environment. Once you've got that going, once you've got that one web server going, move on to you know, replicate that out for all your web servers. And then uh, do the same thing with the load balancer. Monitor and test and repeat those two steps. And keep doing that until you've got a really great environment. When do you stop monitoring? You don't. You just keep monitoring because that, mo that monitoring solution is going to be super valuable when you come up with a problem at some point in the future because there will be a problem at some point in the future. Okay, so why monitor? monitor you, you, you gotta know whether things are improving or not. If you don't monitor, all you're relying on is some customer or CXO saying, hey, the website's broken, which is not a good thing. So you wanna have a monitoring solution in place that's constantly monitoring what's going on with your server, your environment, to verify that it's working well. Now, if you only care about monitoring Nginx, maybe the, the solution that they talked about in the keynote earlier today is the right solution for you. If you wanna look at other uh, platforms as well, then there's a lot of solutions out there. Well, one of the, other, one of the basic ones that um, already exists is the dashboard that's part of Nginx Plus. <coughs> Beautiful dashboard, pretty simple dashboard, but there's a lot of, a lot of things here. But this is pretty awesome, um, but it's only showing me the current status of the, of the Nginx site. I'm not seeing any history of Nginx here. I'm just looking at what's going on right now, which is not always what you need. You often need to see a little bit of history. So here's another possible solution. This is actually Datadog, and um, that's probably pretty small. Um, but what I've got here, it's really small on my screen too. Um, on the top right corner, I've got connections to the load balancer. Um, and I've been testing it out, try, you know, banging my server with a bunch of connections. And ideally, I want to make sure my tests don't last two minutes, which is what all these tests do because I was kind of in a rush. Um, but rather more like an hour or two hours or a day. You know, test these things out and let them run. Make sure that things are working well and then change a the configuration and then continue monitoring uh, as it goes on. Now you might be wondering within Datadog what these vertical, well, what these pink parts are. <coughs> and basically those are vertical lines. And each one represents some sort of event. And I'm saying, show me all the events that have to do with benchmark. And every time I do a benchmark test, right before that I say, um, uh, send an event to Datadog saying, hey, I'm starting a new uh, benchmark, and here are the parameters. And that way I can see, what what did it, why, do, why is there this spike? I've got some explanation of what's going on because I've set this event. And so now I can correlate uh, connections to each web server, load balancer, um, average response time, and so forth. But you don't have to use Datadog. It would be nice if you did, but you don't have to. There are lots of other tools. Uh, one pretty cool one is uh, on GitHub, uh, ngx top. Uh, looks like a pretty cool tool. I have not used it myself. Um, another neat one is Lua Meter. Lua Meter looks pretty close to the previous generation of the uh, Nginx Plus um, dashboard. Looks like it could be pretty neat. It's got some uh, uh, spark lines to show past performance. Pretty cool stuff. And there's a lot of others. Um, uh, if you want to search uh, Datadog competitors, uh, there's lots of the, these guys out there, uh, and, and us too. So what tools do you use to test? Lots of tools to test with. Um, uh, there's AB, uh, Apache Bench. A lot of uh, posts online just saying, oh, don't ever use Apache Bench. So there's also Siege. Well, a lot of those posts will also say, oh, don't ever use Siege. And so there's lots of other tools as well. These are tools that are just going to pound your server with a lot of extra requests. Curl Loader, I haven't used it myself, but there's also Blitz.io. Blitz.io is an online solution that's going to pound your server from lots of different uh, uh, testing servers. Another one I just recently found out about was Tsung or Tsung. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, basically a, a way of setting up a cluster of um, uh, of, of testing boxes, and they're all managed from one place. So I start a job, and all 10 of my testing servers are gonna start pounding my uh, web server with a bunch of requests. Pretty cool. 
or else you could use real customers. Maybe you uh, make a configuration change and let it sit there for a day watching real customers use your site. Has it improved or not? I don't know. So, okay, cool. So I know kind of the general process. I know what tools I'm gonna use to test. I know what kind of uh, monitoring tools I'm gonna use to verify things are working. And I know all the different options that are available to me to set up my load balancing and caching server. Okay, now what metrics that are being monitored, what metrics do I need to look at to verify things are going well or not? Because there are a lot of metrics you could look at. If you're looking at just um, uh, Nginx, then there's uh, potentially up to uh, 20, 30 different metrics that are being updated um, up to every second. Uh, and that's a lot of stuff to look at. So what, what, what's really important? Well, we think the primary metrics that you're going to want to look at are active connections. Active are, um, uh, so number of total connections overall and per upstream. Um, and if there's any deviations from what is normal, then it could indicate some sort of, uh, you know, one of the servers is struggling to process requests or re uh, reaching saturation on one of the servers. And maybe that's because the load balancing method is not really the right one for you. Drop connections. Drop connections is another great one to look at. Um, ideally, this is going to be zero. You don't have drop connections, but hey, drop connections sometimes happen. So try to keep this close to zero. Um, but if it rises, then look out for uh, resource saturation. Resource saturation is never a really good thing. Um, you want to make sure that uh, the resource always has you can handle the load. Request per second. Request per second on its own doesn't really tell you that much. If I just see one number, oh, it's 500 requests per second, that doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't, it's not good or bad. If there's a spike, it could be good, it could be bad, depends on what's the reason for the spike. But if there's you know, constant flow and all of a sudden a sudden drop, well, that's something that I should be alerted about. And uh, so those drastic changes could actually indicate not a problem with Nginx, but maybe something before Nginx, somewhere, you know, your connection to the, to the web or, uh, or something else. Um, some other problem is involved. Another thing to look out for are the error rates, so, or the uh, response codes. Um, so 400 uh, response codes and 500s, um, look out for those. But don't just look at the roll numbers. If I see there are 500, 500 errors, uh, that doesn't really tell me that much. Show me that error divided by total. So show me a percentage of, how, what percentage of all my requests result in 500 errors? And if those errors are climbing, that's probably worth investigating. And if it's a sharp increase, that's gonna need some urgent attention. So something to definitely look out for. Now, unfortunately, it would be really, really cool if in Nginx you had that available as a metric. Number of 400 errors, number of 500 errors, but you don't. You only have that in the log files. And so you're going to need to parse those log files to figure out what is the number of 400 errors and 500s. Um, so you can do that in Datadog with a tool called Dogstream, or we often rely on uh, other partners like Splunk is a great one to use, or uh, uh, Sumo Logic will be a really great one to use in a week or so. Um, and uh, lots of other uh, great tools to process logs and bring that data into Datadog or into the other guys as well. With Nginx Plus, those error rates are available as a metric. Um, so that's another uh, cool thing with Plus. Request processing time. How long is each request taking? You probably don't care about how long is each process taking. You probably care about what's the average for all the uh, requests coming in within a certain time period or going to a certain server. How long does each, or how long on average does each uh, request take to process? And if this is uh, going up, it could uh, point to some issue upstream on one of the web servers. You're getting too many requests. As those number of requests or a number of connections go up, um, the request processing time might also increase uh, depending on what the server is doing. Um, and so that could uh, potentially point to some sort of problem, maybe with the configuration of that server, or um, yeah, probably with the configuration. 
And then the last one I want to uh, mention is available servers per upstream. You know, if, if one of my servers has a problem, OK, that, that kind of sucks, especially if I only have a few servers. But if I've got, I don't know, 10 upstream web servers, and one of them has a problem, eh, oh well, let's fix it, but don't worry about it too much. But if 50% or 80% of my servers are having a problem, oh my god, I better fix that, because that's, that's really bad. Um, so available servers per upstream is definitely another one of those important metrics to uh, make sure you keep an eye on. And so in this session, I wanted to make sure that you knew what the options were around, um, around uh, scaling, around load balancing, and around caching. What are the, all the different options available? Um, what, how you should uh, go about verifying that changes that you make are good changes to make and not bad changes to make. Um, and that's through monitoring. And you know, test it. Bang at the server, bang at the um, uh, load balancer to verify things are working as you expect. Put real users on it to verify that they're seeing what they should see. Um, and then once you do that, look at some key metrics to verify that things really are as good as they should be or are at least heading in the right track. Again, my name is Matt Williams. Uh, I work at Datadog. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at Technovangelist, and my email is Matt Williams or Matt.Williams. Actually, Matt W also works. Matt W at datadoghq.com. Thanks so much. Any questions? Caught about four, three minutes. Any uh, questions? No questions. Nothing. Okay, cool. We're done. <laughs>